Good afternoon, <laughs> or g early evening. <laughs> I'm Joanna Ney, um, the co-curator of Dance on Camera Festival. <laughs> Welcome, and uh, this is actually the 41st Dance on Camera Festival, uh, co-presented by DFA and the F Film Society of Lincoln Center was more of a newcomer to uh, this festival, but for 17 years, we've been collaborating on this. And um, well, it gives me great pleasure to uh, present what I consider a most interesting and adventurous program. We're honoring the filmmaker Shirley Clark uh, with two programs, today and tomorrow at 3.30. Um, and even though, oddly enough, I knew uh, quite a bit about Shirley Clark, except a crucial part for me, which is that she was a dancer, which I didn't know because I didn't know her well. My husband was a film editor on one of her films. And uh, so uh, <coughs> Shirley Clark started out as a dancer and um, made some short dance films, which are pretty amazing. Um, and we're going to show two of them um, first. And uh, the connection that we made between Shirley Clark and Donna Cameron is because Donna Cameron is a visual artist and a filmmaker who then made this collaborative film with uh, Shirley, uh, which is called Shirley Clark in Our Time. But first we will show you these two 16 millimeter, millimeter prints. Uh, and I'm, I'm struggling for the titles because we're showing four of them. Bridges Go Round and Bullfight. And the Bullfight, interestingly enough, uh, has Anna Sokolow. We had a program earlier about Anna Sokolow and Jose Limon. And Anna Sokolow is in Bullfight, uh, so you will see her. OK, and then we will have a conversation. So um, now I'd like to introduce, I'm very happy that we were able to make this terrific blend of films of the Shirley Clark shorts, and then uh, for me to have found um, Donna Cameron, who uh, collaborated with Shirley Clark on this next film. And so I'm very happy to introduce her. And here she is, Donna Cameron. Thank you, Joanna. Thanks for coming tonight. And I'm very honored to be here with um, dance on camera, celebrating Shirley Clark, who's one of our most important filmmakers. Um, Shirley and I met um, in 1987. We began working on a portrait of her at her request. It's a transmedia portrait, and we're going to show it here tonight. It's very experimental. As you see, Shirley was an experimental filmmaker and a great one, and I'm an experimental filmmaker. And we... Um, no, thank you. No, we, we collaborated um, for a while, on the, and I finished the piece, which we will get into later. But um, anyway, this piece, you're going to see another well film tomorrow about Shirley yes, Wright. Yes, we're really uh, paying a tribute to Shirley Clark as a filmmaker and a dance maker. And so we, we have these two films. We have Today and Tomorrow at 3.30, Rome is Burning, which is really a documentary about her, made in 1970. And with it will be some more of the shorts from the Museum of Modern Art that she made in the 50s. OK, so this film is, you've heard the saying, a child is the father to the man. This film is a girl is the mother to the woman. This is about Shirley's childhood and how she thought of it. And we talked often about that. And a lot of the beautiful blending of, um, and superimpositions and cuts that you s have seen in the first two pieces were elements that we brought to this collage piece, and it is a collage um, portrait, very experimental, and um, it's called Shirley Clark in Our Time. Before that, we're going to see a piece I worked on with maestro Fred Kaufman, who's with us tonight. It's a music piece, and it's about his experiences in the desert in Sinai, Goshen, in the Hundred Years' War in Israel. Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur War. War. <laughs> Sorry, my brain's fried. And um, it's a poetic 
um, music and painting piece, but it uses similar visual techniques as the Shirley Clark piece. So and it's called Meditation. It's called Meditation for, for a, lonely a Lonely Flute. And as Fred explained earlier in the discussion uh, over across the street, he in the desert during this time in his experiences during the war felt very lonely and isolated while um, simultaneously appreciating the beauty of the desert and the land, which is on the border of Israel and Egypt. Mm -hmm. um, so, and this is a postmodern painting. So we hope you enjoy the program. Yes, indeed. And afterwards, uh, we're very happy to have Lawrence Kardish, who is the senior curator of film of the Museum of Modern Art for many years and a great friend. And um, he is actually, co there are so many coincidences this year. It's amazing, overlaps. Larry Kardish is actually writing a book about Shirley Clark. And we have seen Anna Sokolo and Shirley Clark. We have seen all these conjunctions, and then meeting Donna and Is this Larry one. Is Larry the director of the, the collective? Uh, la I would like to acknowledge Larry Kardish as someone who championed my work as a experimental filmmaker. He's very important to my work, and um, he I met him as a fledgling filmmaker, film as a fledgling filmmaker, and he's a fledgling curator at the Collective for Living Cinema. In gosh, what <laughs> year was that? Long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> 1980. And so we co we committed ourselves to a correspondence, and he has championed my work. My work and Shirley's are both distributed by the Museum of Modern Art Circulating Film Library, and. Um, also, the collective, the um, filmmakers cooperative. Um, so, well, Lawrence Kardish was an early. Uh, he recognized talent very <laughs> early on, <laughs> when he was very young and you were very young. Too. Right. <laughs> so anyway, here we are, still young. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so please stay because it'll be a fun discussion and um, prepare yourselves for an adventure. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So also, thank you for your new film, uh, Meditation on Lonely Flute. It's very, very beautiful. Thank you. Uh, Don has also been a pioneer of uh, paper movies, which is a whole other process, but I don't think we have to go into that right. now. But, but uh, it, is, it is something else that you, you yourself have perfected. Tell me, talk about your relationship with Shirley vis-a-vis -vis the making of this film. Okay, um, we... We met um, at a program of mine through a mutual friend, and she asked me to work on a multimedia kind of cutting edge portrait of her using um, images that were related to kind of American life and our time, and juxtaposing them with images that her mother had shot of her girlhood. Um, she had seen some of my collage experiments in the show, and some of my lyric, poetic cinema in the show, as well as the paper films. So um, she was really interested in working with me. And we got together, and we hit it off, and we, we were a very good team at working. And we came up with this concept for a collage. And it, it seems like there is humor, is to take humor, mm -hmm or things that might otherwise be funny, but apply them to the frightening situation of women artists and being a woman in the society. Like I said before in the introduction, it's more like a girl as a mother to the woman, mm -hmm. which is a topic that's not often addressed um, seriously in a forum like this. And um, it's often, she, we wanted the film to be entertaining, but also difficult to watch which is a reflection of our lives, um, which is what art is about. So this film is about Shirley Clark, and the girl in the picture reaches out or speaks out to us mm -hmm. through the footage that we collected. Mm -hmm. And is there more footage of her childhood, or w w was this it? This is it, and um, it's not very much footage, but it was a treasure to her. Mm. She treasured it. It was pretty much the only footage that she had. Mm. And her mother shot it in the 1930s 
on 60 millimeter film. And I presume that's her father. That's her father. And um, if you go on Google, I'm not, I'm saying this because I don't want to just say it, but, mm -hmm. um, and you go to Wikipedia and look her up, it does state that her father was a violent bully. And so a lot of the cuts in here reflect the experience of being um, uh, subjected to violent bullyism mm -hmm. um, and um, the way we juxtapose images reflect her sensibilities and she um, loved learning but I think she had issues because of her father's yeah. temperament. Uh, does that have any, anything to do with the arrow shape commercial? Uh, yeah, that's supposed to be the comic relief. Um, we thought it was the comic relief. Yeah. And it has a lot to do with the arrow shape commercial. Uh, I met Shirley when I first came to New York. She was she and Jonas Mikas were my first bosses uh -oh. at the filmmaker at the New American Cinema Group. Mm -hmm. And it seemed to me at that time she was a very strong personality and that even though she was a woman, she was very much in control along with Jonas of what was happening at the new uh, at the New American Cinema Group. Yes, yeah, she was a founding yeah. member of the New American Cinema. She was very much in control, but she was pretty much alone as a female. Mm -hmm. And there was a, an outsider aspect to her presence there. I made, um, I showed this, a preview of this at Union Docs two years yes. ago, and I um, recorded a panel between myself, Jonas Mikas, and Andrew Cullen, who's a film historian. And um, it's on YouTube. Um, Charles, if you Google Shirley Clark and Donna Cameron and Jonas Mikas, it should come up, it's in three parts. But Jonas, we talked extensively about her legacy and her place in, in some more, um, it's a documentary in the documentary tradition. Mm -hmm. Well, it also s struck me as really significant is that she always did consider herself a dancer. Yes. And that she has said that she went into cinema because she failed as a dancer. Could you talk about that, or did she ever talk to you about that? Um, she, she felt that, she never said she failed as a dancer, but she couldn't meet up to her expectations of herself as a dancer. And so she took the camera and she thought of herself as dancing through the camera. And her, es especially evident in films like Bridges Go Round or Skyscraper, mm -hmm. um, there really is a choreography there of the camera and, um, in the landscape and um, a dance in the sun. Yeah, no, that's very, very true. And when I... Uh, organized the first retrospective of her work at MoMA in the, uh, in the 70s. She insisted at that point in her life that she was no longer a filmmaker. And we said, well, we wanted to celebrate you as a filmmaker. She said, only if you recognize what I'm doing now with video. And she was a real pioneer. And what was interesting, because this comes back to the dance aspect, is that she was a video artist almost before anyone else. But it wasn't in terms of narrative. She said, I'm not making many movies. She used the video camera to record people in space and to conflate <coughs> space. And for her, the opening uh, evening of her retrospective at MoMA, we were not allowed, she would not allow us to show a film, but we had to move <laughs> her apartment. She used to live on the, in a cabana on the top of the Hotel Chelsea. And we had to move her living room with their 10 television monitors and the sofa to the stage at MoMA and along with about 10 cameras. And what the opening consisted of was her giving cameras to members of the audience to shoot themselves, to go into the lobby and, to, and then you could see it on the images on the screen. Everyone was totally perplexed, but it was, uh, but it was a brilliant conception of time and space and it was moving about in the space of, 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 of the museum. So I really, th really think that she kept her roots very, very close to her, her dance roots. Yeah, I think so too. She was very much about um, that, well, that's like a live feed now on the, on the web. Mm -hmm. I think she was very much ahead, ahead of her time. 
in terms of relating and um, incorporating her concept of performance and landscape mm -hmm. and the technology of video. And if in, in our panel discussion, Joan has talked extensively about how she was everywhere all the time with her video equipment, everywhere. Yeah. And so talk a little more, please, about the uh, soundtrack of your film. Did you work on it very closely with Shirley? Did she, s did she say there are some sound bits that you must use? Uh, well, yeah, because if you notice the film, g well, here it, it has to do with the pieces of film that we found. The sound on this film is very difficult because it's optical, 60 millimeter optical sound for the most part, which is not stereo, and um, and she wanted to keep close to the elements of the sound pieces that were there. Mm -hmm. So that was one um, one way that she wanted to remain true to the elements, the physical elements of the piece, and of the experience of collecting. Because don't forget, we were meeting and collecting and discussing, so in, along the lines of what you just said about bringing the living room to the stage at MoMA, mm -hmm. we were bringing the collection in the living room to this film center cafe and bringing the film labs you know, to the Hotel Chelsea. So she was pretty much usurping landscape as we know it, and or we, we knew it, and reinventing it in another location. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I mean? So yeah, and, and in terms of getting back to the sound, there were the sounds she wanted to keep closely to were basically the sounds of um, kind of environmental sounds that related kind of to what the people in the pictures were doing, but really did not. Mm -hmm. So you were always having a question in your mind of what space you were in and what you were experiencing on the screen. Because like you said, while it's a screen piece, it's more of an installation piece because even though you're sitting in a theater, you're not really experiencing it as completely as a work of cinema, but you are experiencing but it. But you are. Cinematically. You, yes. You said the work was difficult to watch. I, I didn't find it difficult to watch. I found it very rich and at times perplexing, but not, uh, you know, not difficult. Wondering and knowing Shirley somewhat, wondering what you were saying or what Shirley was saying actually about uh, about herself because well, she was very introspective i mean she very introspective and the film it well it's in th three sections the introduction basically it's her herself her childhood and how she was very much taken with felix the cat and she carried a little statuette of him everywhere everywhere yes. yeah <laughs> <laughs> and um she was also very enamored of Charlie Chaplin and you see the footage of her in the garden she's actually walking backwards and so we found this little piece of the tramp you see him he becomes the wind mm -hmm. and um, she was also very involved with the elements and the earth and the in terms of the landscape around as you can see that also in bridges go round um, I don't know I think does that answer your question Began to yes okay. yes, uh, and do you know? Th did she keep in touch with the with dancers throughout her career after she made Cool World? After also she went to Los Angeles. Do you know anything about her relationship with with dancers at that point? Um, I don't. She never mentioned that to me. Mm -hmm. We never talked much. She talked a lot about Anna Sokolov, how she had studied with her, mm -hmm. and she she felt like I guess she danced and she was a terrific dancer, but sh the same thing of herself as as a filmmaker, she moved on to a different form. She kind of moved through different media. We were talking about transmedia and mastering different media. So again, she was ahead of her time. She was kind of a harbinger of things to come. Yes, in, in many ways. She was also the star of Agnes Varda, another fascinating uh, artist, a woman who was before her times too. Mm -hmm. If any of you get a chance to see Lion's Love, which is a film that Agnes made uh, in, in Hollywood with uh, Shirley Clark. It's quite an extraordinary portrait of, of, of a time and a place and also of, 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 sh of Shirley. Mm -hmm. Did, you, uh, did uh, she speak at all about her acting to you? Um, 
Well, she felt that I think one of the things she had wanted to do with this piece was to perform somehow both of us with it mm -hmm. as it was projected. And I don't know whether that would have included live feed. We discussed that, which would mm -hmm. have been um, an extension of what you were talking about, her show at MoMA with the, with the cameras in the audience and mm -hmm. the cameras outside. You also give a, bit, a, a good shout out to her daughter, Wendy. Yes. Where is Wendy in, in, the, in the, is that the baby? Okay, Wendy, uh, yeah, Wendy is the baby that appears pretty much superimposed on all the uh, in baby images that kind of are embraced by Shirley, the girl, and Shirley, and intergenerationally, mm -hmm. as you see, the great-grandmother, the grandmother, the mother, Shirley, and, the ba and Wendy, the baby. Mm -hmm. So there's a progression, and if you notice, it's very matriarchal. Um, there are no men in those pictures, right. and, and and that's not something we did. That was part of her tradition. I see. I, I, I see. And uh, the film, once you completed it, where ha where was it shown, and what sort of distribution do you have on the film now? Well, the film is was shown at MoMA. Okay. It was shown <laughs> several times, and it was programmed um, in the MoMA 2000 Millennial. Mm -hmm. And it was shown at um, Pacific Film Archives in California and the L.A. Film Forum um, and it, in the Pompidou Center. And I think it was shown, it was shown, it was distributed by Anagram International, Andy Traubner's company, mm -hmm. um, during the 90s. So I don't know where it went to various places in Europe, um, which has more outlets for experimental film. And also at NYU in the director series, it was programmed by Jeremiah Newton. Mm -hmm. um, and is it times. available through, it's available through MoMA, correct? It's available through MoMA and um, Milestone has been interested in, in it. Right. Um, and I haven't committed to anything yet because since Shirley and I both worked at it, I would like to split any proceeds between two accounts mm -hmm. because Shirley's daughter Wendy is starting an archive with, archive with her. So therefore right now it's situated for distribution at MoMA where we've where I've arranged to split any monies between my company and Shirley's archive. Shall we take questions? Nate? <laughs> Yes. There's a yes. woman here. Yes. Okay. Uh, do you think that Shirley was at all influenced by Man Ray or Bunuel? Um, yeah, she was very taken by surrealism and the philosophy of the um, juxtaposition of the real with the with the imaginary and the, the blending of the two and what kinds of world worlds it would create. Um, you can s kind of see that a lot in the in the um, interaction, in the blending of the a lot of the imagery, and the juxtapos juxtaposition of the shots, because it is it is a very surreal collage in in many ways. She was uh, she was also taught by when she decided to go to take a few film courses. I mean, she never really went to a f film school, but she did take a couple of courses. One was with Hans Richter. Uh, and also, she has said that Maya Deren was an influence on her, particularly Maya Deren's dance films. Yeah, well. and I'll repeat this again because there are a couple of things that she had wanted to do, and what I saw that said this last in the in the um, discussion before the show. But she repeatedly said that she wished that um, she and Maya Deren could have she had found a way to link up with her. Or they could have worked together because they were two women. Ascendant at the same time and very important, but they were I shouldn't say very important. I'm saying that but very mm -hmm. isolated but both dancers and both would having to s have the same struggles, but there was no way for them to connect so she saw like our working together as She saw kind of she worked together with her daughter Wendy in a different technique te tradition yeah. We have time for one more question Okay, yeah, yes, ma'am Films that you showed, which I think the material is very interesting, and uh, you know 
how you decided to juxtapose uh, certain uh, parts or certain films? Well, there are several um, discussions going on simultaneously with that. And one was um, her life and the, the things that happened in her life. And two was relationships, films, or pieces of films that showed um, kind of a questioned a sense of um, what someone, Vance Packard, called the hidden persuaders in advertising and in Hollywood cinema, and to question them and bring them to the front of, of, of the, the statement, and also relate them to her self and her life and what influenced her life. Um, also, the, we had discussions about Alzheimer's disease because her mother had it and my grandmother had it. And a lot of the way the film is edited challenges your sense of memory. And that's what I meant by being difficult to watch, not the imagery, which has blended it and works yeah, choreographically. Because memory, you feel there's a narrative there and there is, but you can't put your finger on it. And so we would discuss this at length and how to cut it and how to intercut it. So. Well, I'm afraid that's all the time we have. Oh. We could go on for much longer, yeah. oh, yes. but unfortunately, thank you, thank you, John. Thank, thank you so much.